Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was actually on television um, around three weeks ago now, and I mentioned that I was married, or had been married, and that I had had a bad marriage, is what I mentioned. I mentioned that I married one of the few white Muslims in New York, actually, <laughs> and too young. And I wanted to elaborate on it. I was, I had a bad marriage, and it was partially my fault. Um, for the first year of marriage, I would say, I had what you would call a bad basic attitude toward my wife. I tended to place my wife underneath a pedestal all the time. <laughs> and we used to argue and fight, and we finally decided that we would either take a vacation in Bermuda or get a divorce, one of the two things. And we discussed it very maturely, and we decided finally on the divorce, because we felt that we had a limited amount of money to spend on something, and that a vacation in Bermuda is over in two weeks, you know, but a divorce is something that you always have, you know, so <laughs> it seemed good. And I saw myself as a bachelor again, you know, living in the village in a bachelor apartment with a wood-burning fireplace and a shaggy rug, you know, and on the wall some of those great Picassos by Van Gogh and just great swinging airline hostesses running amok in the apartment, you know. And I got very excited and I ran into my wife. She was in the next room at the time listening to Connell Rad on the radio. And <laughs> she was a very nervous woman. And I laid it right on the line with her. I came right to the point. I said, Quasimodo, I want a divorce. <laughs> no mincing words. And she said, great, get the divorce. But it turns out in New York State, they have a very funny law that says you can't get a divorce unless you can prove adultery. And that's very strange because the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not commit adultery. But New York State says you have to. <laughs> For a while there, it's like a toss-up between the Bible and Rockefeller. You know, you don't know which way to go with it. So I figured one of us has got to commit adultery to get the divorce. I volunteered for it. Because <laughs> I thought it would be a fairly simple matter for me in that I am a very sexy man. <laughs> it so happens. Did you whistle at me? Not long ago, I sold the memoirs of my love life to Parker Brothers, and they're going to make it into a game. <laughs> I'm thin, but fun. Anyhow, when you're married and out of circulation, there's not that many women that you know that you could actually call. And the only woman I knew <laughs> was my wife's best friend, Nancy. So I called up Nancy on the phone, and I asked her if she would have adultery with me. <laughs> and she said, not even if it would help the space program. <laughs> Which I took as a negative at the time. But I didn't give her a bar in my neighborhood, the agnostic bagel shop that traffics in professional type women that earn their living through advanced fondling. And <laughs> there was at the bar a professional type lady, really great with great hair and mascara on the lips, you know, and really <laughs> vicious. And I explained my situation to her and she was very willing but too expensive. And, uh, <laughs> The plan was that if I could convince her I was still attending New York University, I qualified for a student discount. <laughs> so anyhow, what finally happened was my wife committed adultery for me uh, rather well. I felt she, uh, she's always been more mechanically inclined than I was. <laughs> I, um, I guess I'm going to go now. I, I told you about my love life. I married a very immature woman, and um, 
it didn't work out. See if this is not immature to you. Um, I would be home in the bathroom taking a bath and my wife would walk right in whenever she felt like and sink my boat. <laughs> I sound bitter now. I, uh, she has all the charm, I think, of a southern sheriff. I, uh, Anyhow, I want to go because I said my thing, but uh, I finished. You should see this while I have it out. Actually, I was checking my time. They allowed me five minutes. This is um, Speaks for Breeding, and it's mine. Uh, it's an antique gold heirloom. That's really <laughs> spectacular. My grandfather, on his deathbed, sold me this watch. <laughs> I don't know if, if most of you at home are bothered uh, by commercials as much as I am, but I have a little suggestion to make to you to start things off. Uh, the, the commercials that particularly bother me, I put new endings to, and, and you might try to do this. You change the ends of the commercials. This is an example of a very familiar commercial you've seen a couple hundred times of the dentist talking to the patient in the chair with this new ending. This is the way it goes. Uh, Mr. Jones, I recommend you try to brush your teeth after every meal. You have entirely too many cavities. Well, uh, Doc, I can't carry a toothbrush around with me all day. <laughs> you know, I say that's right, isn't it? <laughs> all right. Uh, this, this is also the time of the year when you will be reading about a ship. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Let me write that down, would you, just a minute? In case we forget it. Uh, this is about the time of the year when a ship will break in half off the Florida coast and some captain will remain on board. And of course, all the newspapers covered and all the magazines and all the TV stations. And this very heroic figure, which from time to time about this year sort of buoys us all up and usually CBS will go down to cover it, and it's usually covered like this. This is David Schoengren aboard the Coast Guard Cutter Vandalia. We're barely 200 yards off the once proud ship, the flagship of the Swedish Freighter Company, and through the driving rain and the high seas, I can just barely make out the solitary figure of the captain, an heroic human being against a vast and angry sea. Get me off this lousy boat! <laughs> this, what I really came to talk to you about tonight, uh, my lecture for tonight, is on, uh, as many of you know, if you've gone to work for large corporations, usually during the first week, they invite you into a room. And on, in this room is a screen, and which they are going to show slides, and there's a phonograph record and a record on it, and it's called the New Employee Talk. And all the new employees for that week are brought into this room. And on the record is a man's voice, and from time to time it will be interrupted by a bonk, which is a sign for the slide operator to change the slide. And this is sort of a stereotype of all the new employee talks I've attended. <coughs> Welcome, new employee. Bonk. <laughs> And welcome to the United Insurance Company's family. We certainly hope you'll enjoy it here. First, we'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of United. Bonk. <laughs> On the first page in your booklets, you'll see this picture of our office as it was in 1900, the year it was founded. And on page two, bonk, <laughs> as it is today. As you can see, it is entirely unchanged. even to the desks and some of the employees. <laughs> Speaking of employees, Bonk, here is a picture of our oldest employee, Dale Vendeventer. Dale Vendeventer, in the great tradition of United Insurance, started in the mailroom in 1910 and is still there. <laughs> you see him here being congratulated by our president, Dale Vendeventer, Jr. <laughs> At a 
party celebrating his fourth stroke. <laughs> you have also received a copy of our company newspaper, United Doings. It is an interesting and exciting newspaper and keeps you informed of what is happening throughout the company. Here on the first page, you see a picture of our second oldest employee, Alan Grape, and his four sons, four of his five sons who now work for United. Alan's oldest son, Mark, is the only member of the family who doesn't work for United. Mark is a bookie in New York City. <laughs> On page two are some very interesting pictures of our annual strike. <laughs> and here's a, a familiar face, Dale Vendervenner Sr. overturning the car of our president. <laughs> see some of our employees beating up our director of labor relations. <laughs> His next picture is a little blurred. They turned on the cameraman. <laughs> Here you see some pictures taken at our annual suggestion dinner. Here you see Cecil Treadlow receiving a $10 gift certificate for his winning suggestion. He suggested that we do away with the suggestion program. <laughs> On page four, our company sport page, you see our bowling team captain, Byron Logan, trying to stick his fingers in the bald head of our auditor, Mr. Raul Smith. <laughs> You've probably gathered by now that United is a fun place to work, and we hope you enjoy many happy years here. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Um... I'm talking to you about football, mainly because this is, you know, the Rose Bowl and everything. It's coming out. <laughs> and you don't have any roses this year. Ha <laughs> ha. But uh, don't boo you. Hey, come on. None of this thing. Yet, uh. Anyway, uh, football can be combined with history, as I found out as sitting in history class thinking of football. <laughs> now, uh, for instance, now, before each football game, you have a referee. And he flips a coin after he introduces the two team captains. And I was thinking, like, you could do that in history with some of the wars. For instance, now, the referee comes out before any football game. You've seen it, the game of the week or any time. Guy comes out. It's Captain Harvard's uh, visiting team. It's Captain Soldier's the home team. Captain Soldier's Captain Harvard's. Uh, Captain Harvard's call a toss. He calls heads. His tails, you lose a toss. Your team wins. What will you do, Captain? Now, he'll do whatever's to his advantage. We will receive. We will receive. <laughs> All right. This team here has let to receive. It will receive. What do these guys do? It will kick off. It will kick off. All right. This team here will kick off. It will kick off. <laughs> okay. And then they start the game. Now, so I was thinking, like, what about if we went back in history to the Revolutionary War and you had the same referee, right? <laughs> okay. British and the settlers. Captain Harvard said, British uh, visiting team here. It's Captain Soldier and the Settlers. Uh, Captain Soldier said, it's Captain Harvard said, British, sir. Call a toss, the British call ahead. It's tails, you lose the toss. Your team wins there, Settlers. What will you do? All right, the Settlers say that during the war, they will wear any color clothes that they want to, shoot from behind the rocks, the trees, and everywhere. <laughs> said, your team must wear red and march in a straight line. Don't have much time here. We've got to get off, you know. <laughs> on and off. Zip them in. Or some folk singers. Come and get me. Um, <laughs> since uh, I played a lot of football. I played when I was in the service. We played different teams. We played a prison team. And uh, no, really, prison teams are gas. They got the greatest football players in the world. Mostly because they have nothing to lose, you know. <laughs> Hey, uh, like the, their starting 11 came off of death row, you know. They didn't care about nothing. Just killed, tackle you in the huddle everywhere, you know. <laughs> Biggest thing they did was they marched off an 80-yard penalty right out of prison. <laughs> but um, anyway, I played at Temple University, which is in Philadelphia. We had, we had a tremendous team going for us to play big schools like Gettysburg. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> anyway, uh, our coach gave us a tremendous talk, and the talk... 
in the, in the locker room for you girls that wonder what goes in the locker room on in the locker room you know the coach gives you a big talk because you got to smash against 11 guys you know and it needs to be psyched out for it sort of like going into finals cold you know <laughs> and uh, it's his uh all right fellas he said get up for the put the cards down where you please and get yourselves dressed and get up for the game now listen you guys got to get up for this game because we need it bad we've lost about 80 in a row here <laughs> Come on, put the cards down. Now listen, say fight, fight. Let me hear you say kill, kill. Are you guys going to be ready? Say, yeah, coach and the guys started to feel it, and Graham started screaming. <laughs> Rah, they turn out, ripping the lock of the place. Okay, but the queen goes on the jack, the jack. <laughs> All right, if you guys are ready, let me see you jump up and down. They jumped up and down. He said, if you guys are ready to kill him, say kill. Kill, are you guys ready? Say, yeah, well, go get him. We ran and the door was locked. <laughs> It's true that I was booked on the show uh, around three or four weeks ago, and it's not my first TV appearance, but I was, um, I never joined before this AFTRA, which is an actor's union, and I had to join it to do this television program, and when you join the union, they make you join, it's compulsory, uh, a hospitalization plan, and it's a very funny plan, because it's like the Columbia Record Album Club, you know? <laughs> They send me every month a list of operations, you know, and I got to pick out six for the year that I want, you know. Then they remove from me a bonus internal organ of my own choosing, and I get a Bach record when the whole thing is over. So I'm happy. I'm not, I wanted to use my minutes up here tonight to uh, relieve myself uh, of a sense of repressed hostility against the law. I have never had, this is true, any brushes with the law of major consequence. I, uh, this doesn't count, this is insignificant. I was once sitting home in my house and some cars pulled up around the house and they shined in searchlights and I heard a voice over a loudspeaker say, we have your house surrounded. This is the New York Public Library. <laughs> so they, they wanted me like to throw out a tale of two cities, you know, and come out with my hands. It was a very bad situation at the time, a lot of smoke and everything. And I was unhappy about it. Now, Recently, fairly recently, I moved uptown to Madison Avenue and 77th Street, and it's a good neighborhood. It's a very nice neighborhood, and it's a fun place to live. I, uh, on my corner when I first moved in, this is just one funny story, uh, I have a drugstore, and a woman ran in. She was absolutely beside herself. Her husband had reached for the wrong bottle on the medicine cabinet and had taken poison by mistake. Now, this is a funny story. He was home uh, on the floor, like kicking, you know, and turning blue and everything, and it was a real emergency. She needed an antidote desperately, and it was a very tough situation. And it turns out the druggist was Alan Funt. <laughs> he had her on in the store for a half hour there, you know, with things going. So it's a good place, and it's happy, and very convivial and everything. But because there's a lot of money up there, and it's an opulent type neighborhood, they keep on robbing us all the time. This is a big problem. My apartment alone was robbed about four times in two years. And they kept breaking in and taking things, you know, and I didn't know what to do about it. So finally I put on my door a little blue and white sticker that said, We gave. You know? <laughs> That would be the end of it. But a man in my building, a Mr. Russo, a very nice man, was held up in the lobby. Two big guys held him up late at night, you know, with a bottle and a stick and everything. And they wanted all this cash, you know, and Russo, like a jerk, tried to sign for it, I think, for tax reasons or something. And they hit him a tremendous shot across the frontal lobe, you know? And he fell to the floor in the lobby in a, in a funny little crumpled heap. And he's never really been the same since the blow to the head, you know? He, he smiles a lot now. And, and he, he laughs out of context, you know? And he, he just sits on the edge of his bed and recounts his life, but not in sequence, you know? He, he knows to say his name if you ask him, but he's not as perceptive as, say, the average tree stump. And he formerly was a, a, a lucid type, you know? He would react to a pin trick at least. He was a, a, a... Now it's mostly finger painting and connecting the dots and everything, you know? And it's that kind of life for him. And people said to me, Woody, like, you're slight of stature, you know, why don't you build yourself up in the event there's like a hostile incursion from the outside world, you could come on, you know? And I went to Vic Tanny's for about eight weeks. I did and I lifted and I bent and I squatted and I did everything they wanted and nothing happened to me at all, you know. And I finally got the idea maybe I should just give Vic Tanny the cash and ask him to walk me home nights, you know. <laughs> Not a bad thought. Now, there's, there's a kid in my building.
This is true. There's a kid in my building, a little a cretinous type named Leon, who takes karate lessons all the time, you know? And Leon's always walking around with his hand cocked at a right angle like this, you know? <laughs> He's a difficult kid to reason with on any level, you know? And they said that I should take judo because it's a great equalizer and everything, and, you know, it's... But I'm essentially, you know, a practical type, and I've boiled judo down to the principle that the bigger your opponent is, the bigger the beating he's going to give you, you know? <laughs> seems right to me, you know, so I wanted to get rid of it, and that was the end. But my friends told me in the back of Esquire magazine, you can send away for a fountain pen that shoots tear gas, you know, and it's a, a real pen, and it secretes like a gaseous billow, you know, and it could disorient the dog or something. It's a good pen to have, and I sent away, it came seven and a half dollars in a plain brown wrapper, you know, and for the very ashamed, and I put my cartridges in one night and clipped it into my breast pocket, and I went out on the town. So friends uptown were having a surprise autopsy or something, I was invited, it was a big deal, now. and I'm going out for the evening and I'm coming home by myself at 2 a.m. in the morning and standing in my lobby is a Neanderthal man, you know, with the eyebrow ridges, the long arms and everything, you know. He had just learned to walk erect that morning, you know. He came right to my house in search of the secret of fire. He was he had boiled life down to the principle, sun good, you know, he knew that, but beyond, like, he, he was a tree swinger in the lobby there, you know, a mouth breather looking at me, and I quickly pulled off my wristwatch and dangled it because they are mollified, I hear, by shiny objects sometimes. The tick-tock sound is very soothing to him, you know, but he ate it, and I was really impressed with it. And I stepped back, you know, and I pulled out the fountain pen, I unscrewed the tear gas pot and pressed the trigger, and some ink trickled on my shirt, and I made a mental note to call Esquire and tell them, you know, because I'm standing in the lobby at 2 a.m. with, obviously, the product of a broken home, you know, I had a fountain pen in my hand, I tried writing on him with it a little bit, you know, but it didn't know something witty, I felt, and he came at me and started to tap dance on my windpipe, and very quickly, I'm alert, I lapsed into the old Navajo Indian trick, of screaming and begging. And he backed me off to the wall and he started to remove my wisdom teeth, you know. And it was really pressure for me and I'm trying to reason with him because I'm civilized, you know. And I tell him he's the product of an economic squeeze, you know. And he's hitting, we have steps in my lobby in case someone wants to hit your head on something, it's there, you know. And he's pounding it and I offered to send it to camp if he wanted, you know, anything. And finally, the police came in at the last minute and they looked around and they took his side, which I felt was, you know, an extreme poor taste for that thing. Now, that was my second brush. My third and final was the short one, the absolute worst. Across the street from me is Central Park. And Central Park is really populated by difficult types, you know, with zippers and sideburns and everything and black jackets. And they go through the park dismantling social workers and things, you know. And they were doing, Central Park does an outdoor production of Hamlet all the time, you know. It's a big thing. They do Shakespeare under those stars. And they were doing a great Hamlet one evening. And in the middle of the production, these six guys come walking through the park, you know, with the jackets and the boots and the whole thing. And they came upon the production of Hamlet, and they grabbed Polonius. And they held his head under the duck pond, you know, that was immediate. And they got Guildenstern and Rosencrantz, and they broke their glasses right off the bat. They're the first. And the guy who was playing Hamlet, you know, felt obligated to do something because he was the lead in the production. But it's funny, you can't come on too strong with them when you're wearing leotards. You know, it doesn't... Uh, <laughs> Hark and Prithy doesn't cut any ice with these thumpers. Anyhow, the upshot of the whole story was they grabbed Ophelia, but fortunately she turned out to be a cop, so it worked out all right. <laughs> Anyhow, now I have to go because I have... But I have a message in my work, if you were listening closely, and that is you should love your neighbor and lay off fatty foods. Good night. Oh, little... Uh... My, 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 I, I've been, I've been, my kid brother, he's a lazy kid. One day's work is all the work he did. Wrote a song, Tyler Wrong, up in the because it is going strong. That's one of my big hits. <laughs> I made a record of that song years ago. I sang on one side and there was an apology by Thomas Edison on the other. <laughs> George M. Cohen and the other gang heard my brother when the song he sang. He said that it cannot miss, it's bound to be a hit. You know, I've been singing all my life. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, um... You know, when I, when, the, when I was first born, the doctor kept slapping me, but I wouldn't stop. I finished two choruses of Ain't Misbehaving. <laughs> then when I started to sing in the heart of a cherry, they turned the heat off in my incubator. <laughs> it's a good thing I was smoking a cigar at a froze to death. <laughs> you know, the reason I'm not recognized as one of the great singers that I, is that I never had a gimmick. You know, something that people talk about, like, like, like Dean Martin's drinking. Now, Dean Martin walks on the stage and he sings a song with a drink in his hand. And he'll be a star as long as his liver holds out. 
Uh, now when they, when, they, when they make a picture, the minute they want somebody that drinks, they hire Dean Martin. <laughs> and he's a smash in all of these pictures. Now he takes about 40 or 50 drinks a day. Not because he likes it, he wants to stay warmed up. If the right part comes along, he's ready. <laughs> I saw him last night and boy, was he ready. <laughs> he was under a table rehearsing his next picture. Phil Harris was under there, too, trying to steal the part away from him. <laughs> Who do you think got it? Lawrence Welk. <laughs> he, uh, he doesn't drink, uh, but uh, those champagne bubbles make it look like he does. <laughs> but that's his gimmick, champagne bubbles. And there's Bing Crosby. He's got a reputation for, for living up to being a father. That's not easy work at his age. <laughs> but that show business... Bob Hope is known for his energy, and Crosby's doing all the work. <laughs> Look, Bob Hope has four kids. That's not bad for a fellow who's never home. <laughs> and Jack Benny's gimmick is being stingy. And that's not true. When I played Las Vegas, Jack Benny came on to see me. And the minute he saw the crap table, he ran over to the table and he grabbed the dice. In fact, they were still talking about it the next day. Do you know that he held the dice for one hour and 45 minutes? Finally he threw them and rolled a crap. <laughs> Lost a dollar and somebody had to hold him for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> and there's Jane Mansfield who nobody can hold for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> Ethel Merman who was married for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> and there's Zsa Zsa Gabor. <laughs> You know, her gimmick is glamour and sex appeal. And um, we did a television show together, and um, we were supposed to play a love scene together. And I went up to her, her apartment to rehearse the scene, and, and I played it for real. I wanted to see if this gimmick works. And I put my arms around her, and I hugged her, and I squeezed her, and I kissed her. And she sat there, just looked at me, and laughed. She's, uh, she's got a great sense of humor, but no sex appeal. <laughs> I'm lucky it turned out that way. At my age, I even get tired when I hold on to my electric toothbrush. I was coming in from Baltimore to do the show, and, well, I was on the train there, and I'm settled in my seat. I'm very relaxed, very relaxed, and the first thought that passed through my mind was to familiarize myself with the surroundings. And I glance across the aisle, and I notice that the lady occupying the seat there had her baby with her. Ugly baby. <laughs> you know, bad looking baby. Now, generally I'd hesitate about passing an opinion about somebody's kid, but this was, even if I don't say it, it's an ugly baby. <laughs> I, I, I only took one quick look, like, like that, and I saw it. <laughs> In from the front of the coach comes this guy, the guys, he's had a few. And as he approached the section where the woman was with the baby, he stops and he stared, like that. <laughs> And the woman, the woman's watching him. She's watching him from the corner of her eye. She says to him, what are you looking at? The guy says, I'm looking at that ugly baby. <laughs> That's a bad looking baby lady. <laughs> I bet you save a lot of money with that baby. <laughs> well, you don't have to hire any babysitter. Nobody's gonna bother that kid. <laughs> She gets offended. <laughs> Does that make sense? As he pulls the emergency cord, the train stop, there's a big scene in there, all everybody's crowding around there, and you know the guy who goes through the train selling those 25 cent sandwiches for a buck and a half. <laughs> he comes in, big scene, the conductor comes in, the conductor says, what's going on here? What's going on here? And the lady said, this fellow just insulted me, and I don't have to spend my money to ride this railroad and be insulted. The conductor said, now calm down, lady. He said, Madam, the Pennsylvania Railroad will go to any length to avoid having differences between the passengers. He said, perhaps it would be more to your convenience if we were to rearrange your seating. <laughs> and as a small compensation from the railroad, if you'll accompany me to the dining car, we'll give you a free meal. Maybe we'll find a banana for your monkey. <laughs> uh, Jack and I have often uh, discussed on the show my aversion to flying and... Uh, it, some of the airlines are after me not to fly on their lines because <laughs> I, uh, I whimper during the flight and, 
And when we hit an air pocket, I go, ah! <laughs> and, <laughs> it's, gotten, it's gotten so bad that I, I finally went to a hypnotist. I really did. And, and what he does is he puts you in a trance. He puts you under hypnosis and then tries to explain to you logically what apparently won't get through when you're conscious. And that is that, that actually more accidents happen in your own home than happen on a plane. For instance, in your bathroom, there are more accidents slipping on the floor or getting out of the tub than happen on a plane. It, with the result that I, now I don't mind flying as much, but I am scared to death to go into the bathroom. <laughs> and a bathroom on a plane, forget it. You know. Where my aversion to flying came from was uh, when I was in the Army, I, I wanted to go to Hawaii. I had a three-day pass, and I didn't have a lot of money. And I went down to uh, Los Angeles, which was near where I was stationed. And I wanted to take a non-scheduled airline because they charged less. And they were running ads at that time for non-scheduled airlines. And I saw this one ad. It said, uh, take a chance on the Mrs. Grace L. Ferguson uh, Storm Door and Airline Company. <laughs> so... <laughs> The price was right, so I went out to the address it gave, and it was this woman's home. She had a little, she had a little counter set up in her living room, and uh, we had to go up to the John to weigh our baggage. I remember that. <laughs> then we uh, we all got in her Volkswagen, and she drove us out to the airport, and we got aboard this DC-1 called <laughs> called Leonola Gay, and which I vaguely remember from World War II. And we were out about an hour or so, and the captain came out, and he gave an address, which uh, sort of summed up the, the uh, things we could expect on this flight, and uh, this is why I don't care to fly too much. He came out like this. Well, you, you're the navigator. If you can't find it, how do you expect me to? <laughs> Good evening. Uh, welcome aboard the uh, Mrs. Grace L. Ferguson uh, Airline and Storm Door Company. We uh, don't know how much you know about our airlines, uh, we've been in business uh, about a week now. <laughs> Our airline was founded on the philosophy that overseas transportation fares were getting out of hand. And what we've attempted to do is eliminate uh, many of the frills and extras and then pass this savings on to you, like uh, old maintenance and radar and a uh, <coughs> whole, whole bunch of uh, technical instruments up in, in the cockpit. Uh, in incidentally, I'd, uh, I'd like to apologize for your having to stand all the way. <laughs> if I could give you a little tip there, you might uh, try alternating your arms through those uh, straps above your head. I think you'll find that uh, your arm won't go to sleep. Oh, uh, you folks flying tourists, you don't, uh, you don't have any straps, so don't, uh, don't, <laughs> don't bother looking for them. Uh, we're going to be flying mostly over water, and we're required to, to make this announcement. Uh, actually, there, there is little danger of this happening. Uh, if we should have to ditch, uh, you receive plenty of warning uh, because our co-pilot becomes hysterical. And, <laughs> and he'll start running up and down the aisles uh, yelling, we're going to crash or, or, <clears throat> or something like that. Uh, however, he gets a little panicky and he has a tendency to, to run his words together. Uh, at le least he has in the past anyway. So... If, <laughs> If you see him running up and down the aisles and, and you can't make out what he's saying, why, uh, might, you might slip into your life jackets. Uh, I'd <laughs> like to take just a moment here to answer some questions you may have, may have about the flight. This woman right here. Ma'am, I'll repeat the question if, if you don't mind. If, if we should have to ditch, how, how long would the plane uh, remain afloat? Um, that's awful hard to say, ma'am. Uh, some of them go down like a rock, you know? <laughs> and, and then others will stay up for two, three minutes. It's, uh, it has something to do with the engines and the wings. I, I never really uh, did understand it. Uh, let's take the... Uh, uh, I'll get you next, sir. I want to get the gentleman way in the back. Yes, sir. Sir, could, could you speak up just a bit? The, the roar of the engines, I, I can't quite make out what you're saying. Oh, there, they've stopped now, sir. Harry, <laughs> uh, the engines went out again. That's that's got him. Yes, sir. You want you want to? Uh, sir, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go to this gentleman. I I can't un understand what you. All right, all right. You can try it that way. The first word <laughs> sounds sounds like running, racing. 
Grand. Oh, it sounds like Grand. Uh, man. Group. Whole bunch of men. Whole men. Men. Oh, men, it's right behind you there, sir. <laughs> I'm glad I got to your question ahead of this gentleman. <laughs> I, uh, I really should be getting back in the cabin. We have it on automatic pilot, but uh, the thing keeps kicking in and out all the time. <laughs> you never really know whether it's on. Uh, one of the reasons I came out, I nearly forgot, have any of you uh, ever ever been to Hawaii before? This woman, woman right here. Uh, it, it's sort of liver-shaped, isn't it, ma'am? <laughs> It's more around. Ma'am, would you mind stopping by the cabin as we're coming in and, and pointing it out to us? We sure appreciate it. And I hope you have a very nice flight. Thank you very much. I'm a deep up on the mountain. I'm above. And you are down. I'm ready to the top. Yeah. Okay. Champion, what you 